Our next speaker needs no introduction. He is the MD of Google India, Mr. Rajan Anandam. Everyone, how's everyone doing? Long day. How's it been in the Emerge Out group? Have you guys emerged yet? Out. Okay. Um, it's great to be here. Um, wanted to thank NASCOM for uh, giving me the opportunity to join all of you uh, here today. You know, while they're while they're finishing up, you know, I want to take us back to 1995. I look around the room, I think except for about half of you, most of you had probably graduated by 1995. That's good. Graduated from college, not kindergarten. How many internet users in the world in 1995? Guesses? 100 million internet users, 1995. 17 years ago. Other guesses? Sorry? 1 billion. 1 million. 200,000. Okay, 1995, there were 16 million internet users in the world. Okay, that was 17 years ago. So now fast forward to the year 2000. And by the way, along the way, Amazon went public in the year 1997. There were less than 40 million internet users in the world. Right? That's when Amazon went public. A lot of people don't remember this. So now let's forward to year 2000. How many internet users in the year 2000? 200 million. Other guesses? 50 million. No, that was, remember I said 1997. This is an exponential curve, by the way. Uh, 340 million. And then 2005 crossed a billion internet users. 2010, 2011 crossed 2 billion internet users. So basically, in a period of 17 years, we've gone from pretty much the entire world asking the question, what is the internet, to now having 2 billion consumers in the world on the internet. And at the current growth rates, no acceleration, not much deceleration, by 2015, we will have 3 billion people on the internet. That is 40% of the entire world's population on the internet. Now what I'd like you to do is I want you to imagine 3 billion people on the internet having access to the kind of technology that's actually in this video. Many of you have seen this video, so you have to bear with me, but those of you that have seen this video I want you to closely observe what's going on in this video. And I want you to imagine a world where 3 billion consumers have access to this technology at a fraction of the cost of a feature phone today. Let's run it. Lights.
That's Google Glass, launched at Google I.O. six weeks ago by Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. What you just saw is actually not the future. What you just saw is actually the current. And the only thing that's going to change between now and next year and the year after and three years from now, by the time 2015 hits, and we'll have three billion people on the world on the internet, is that Google Glass and many other products like Google Glass will be available around the world to three billion users for a fraction of the cost of a feature form. That, we believe, is the opportunity for technology entrepreneurs around the world. And what I'd like to do is, if you, one of the reasons I like that video is, and, and Google Glass, is because it talks about, or really it brings together several of the technologies that are going to shape the world we live in, or the technologies that we are going to live with and live in over the next five, ten years. So what I'd like to do now is take ten minutes to talk about five major trends that we believe are going to not only have already started shaping the way we live, have started shaping consumer lives, have started shaping enterprises, but will gain in prominence over the next several years. So the first trend, and we believe the most important trend in technology, consumer or business, is mobility. Right? And this enormous tsunami around mobility creates unprecedented opportunities both for consumer-centric internet businesses, or if you want to build a consumer-centric internet business, as well as for enterprises. I want to take India, which as many of you know, we have 120 million users, and at that we are already the third largest internet market in the world. India will cross 300 million users by 2015. Almost all of the 180 million new Indians who will come online will come online through a mobile device. Very few of them actually will have access to a desktop or a notebook. Now let's say you're trying to build a business in the consumer internet in India. right? And let's for a minute say you want to build flowers.com. I know none of you probably in this room are trying to do that. See, there was flowers.com that was built in the US. It's a traditional web business, web-based e-commerce. Six months ago, in India, 71% of the search queries for flowers were on a mobile phone. Flowers.com in India is not going to be built the way flowers.com got built in the US. The flowers.com in India, and it will get built, somebody's going to build it, will be built off a phone. Right? And you can go vertical after vertical after vertical. Over the next four or five years, what we're going to see is first generation and second generation established consumer internet businesses rapidly migrate to the web. But much more interestingly, the new large businesses that get built around the world that are consumer facing will be built mobile first, and many will get built mobile only. Now let's talk about enterprises. How many of you are building IT services companies? So not product companies, but IT services companies. Anybody? Got one? Okay, we've got, we've got a handful of you, right? I know in IT services, unless you're one of the very large players or you've got a deep niche, it's difficult to scale. Here's an idea to scale an IT services company. Go hire 100 kick-ass mobile engineers. You'll be sold out from now till you die. Because hiring one mobile engineer is really difficult. Hiring 50 is impossible. Why? Because it's the future. So first trend, mobility. The second trend is natural user interfaces, right? What you saw on that was Google Glass. Right? And by the way, uh, Sergey Brin demoed the product. Google I.O. Those of you that want, just go to YouTube, say Google, I, Google Glass Project I.O. You'll see it. You know, interesting thing about that, right? That's a computer on your glass. There's no keyboard. 
Data entry completely changed. Data entry now is voice. Glasses, difficult to touch. Gla watch, touch, possible. And vision. Have you guys seen doing a Google search or a Bing search with your retina? Retina and voice, no keyboard. And that actually exists. Natural user interfaces, right? The computer as we know it, by the way, I mean, we talk today, there's huge amounts of debate. Tablets, smartphones, feature phones. I want you to imagine a world where everything's a computer. Everything's a computer. Your wallet's a computer. These walls are computers, right? And the interaction mechanism is no longer about entry. It's not about touch. There's no keyboard anymore. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to the computer. I want to touch, and I want to see. Natural user interface in a country like India creates enormous opportunities. Why? Well, a couple of reasons, actually. Not more than 150 million Indians speak English. And about four, 500 million Indians, even by the basic definition of literacy, are not literate. Right? So how are they going to interact with the internet? Well, kind of like how they use phones today. They're going to talk. Solve voice in India in local language. You got a billion dollar company. Guarantee. Nobody has solved voice in India. Actually, nobody's really solved voice today outside of English in America and Japanese. The rest of the world, voice, not a solved problem. So all of you that are any voice engineers in the room? Well, that's a great space to be in, right? Major trend. Second, major, third major trend is video. Two billion consumers on the, around the world now in the internet. Over 60% of them watch online video, use online video. 1.2 billion online video viewers around the world. Five years from now, every website will be 90% video. How many of you like to read text on websites? Anybody? Right? The most successful text product has how many characters? 114. 500 million users, four years. 114 characters. That's pretty much the new norm. How many of you like to watch video? I do. I'd much rather watch a video than read some text. 90 to 95% of all websites five to seven years from now will be video. Anything you can say in text, you can say better in video. So imagine a world where today we have 340 million websites around the world. The world. It, by the way, the number used to be 235,000 in 1995. Imagine a world where 340 million websites goes to, let's say, half a billion websites or a trillion websites, and every single one of them is all in video. If you're in tech, if you're in software, that creates enormous opportunity, enormous. What's the most basic problem you've got to solve? Bandwidth. You want to build a billion dollar company in India? You solve video on very low bandwidth. Unsolved problem. Huge opportunity. Video analytics, huge problem. Huge opportunity, right? And now I want you to imagine, how many of you heard of a company called WebMD? Most successful healthcare portal in the US. Now I want you to imagine a WebMD that's built ground up only using video. You think that'll be cool? Somebody's going to do that. And that product, that business, is not going to be built by WebMD. You know why? It's called Innovator's Dilemma. They can't. Somebody else is going to do that. 
And when it's done, it's going to be huge. Because I'd much rather see the doctor in person than read some review. Video. Mega trend. The fourth one really is social, right? And I think all of us have been reading about social. Facebook, almost a billion users. You add up all the other social networks, another several hundred million. 65 to 70 percent of worldwide internet users are on one form of social network or another. Now, what's interesting is not for most companies to try to build another social network. You can. What's interesting is to say, how can you reinvent industries leveraging social? What's the world's most popular music streaming product today? What is it? Yeah, between the two names. They're building music off a social layer, right? Most successful gaming company, well, at least until the last earnings release. Zynga, built off a social paradigm, right? What is interesting about social is the fact that social can reinvent industries. Expedia, C-Trip, some of the leading online travel sites that have been built in India very successfully, do not leverage social. I don't mean use Facebook to drive traffic. I mean build a product that's social ground up. Enormous opportunities to reinvent businesses using the social paradigm, and that's the power. And if you're building a software company, a B2B company, the next wildfire, right? How many of you know what wildfire is? Those are you know, a whole bunch of social analytics companies in the room, right? It's going to be, should be built in India, right? Why? Because India is already the second largest market for Facebook in the world. 50 plus million users going to 100 million. If we have 50, 100, 200 million social users, why is it that social-based tool companies cannot be built in India? Wildfire was a company that was bought by Google. Fourth trend, social. The fifth trend, it's not really a trend, but I believe it's probably the single, after mobile, the single biggest opportunity for building new businesses and scaling existing businesses is SMB. There are over 100 million small businesses in the world. Give or take, 15 to 20 million of them are decently connected today. 90 plus percent of them will be fully connected over the next decade. Now I want you to imagine a world where you have 90 million small businesses connected, always on. First thing it does is it democratizes IT completely, right? All of a sudden, all the really cool, heavy, sexy stuff that used to be available to the big companies, some of the CIOs who are here, is now available to everybody, number one. Number two, what's even better if you're a founder or building a startup or an early stage company is now you can reach them, right? The biggest issue with SMB has been how to reach them. Can't reach them. Well, guess what? Imagine they're all connected. Imagine they're all reasonably web savvy. You can, you can reach them. Today, you can launch a SaaS company in India. Within three months, you can have 2,000 to 5,000 paying customers today. Why? The internet. The distribution reach that the internet creates, not just for consumer, but for businesses, is enormous. And I actually believe that the next multi-billion dollar software companies or the cloud companies will actually be built off SMB. Salesforce was one of the early ones. Everybody talks about Salesforce now. They penetrated the large enterprise. Salesforce built the first $500 million on SMB. It's only over the last four or five years they've actually penetrated the large enterprise. So if you've got a product, I mean, I was sitting through the last session, if you've got IT SME, I guess is the term, right? Let's call it a small software company. I like that better. Or maybe a small hardware company. If you've got a small software company, your odds of breaking through with small businesses 
much, much higher. Why? Because they decide quickly, right? Now imagine a world where all of them are connected and you can distribute globally immediately. And today reach 15 to 20 million businesses. Imagine a world where you can reach 90 million businesses on the internet. Over the last five years, we've seen consumer internet companies go from zero to 100 million users in two years and go from zero to half a billion users in four years. My view is that over the next decade, we will see B2B companies go from zero to a million businesses in two years. Imagine that. Right? And why is that possible? Because you're going to have all these SMBs online. They're going to reasonably know what to do online. And all of a sudden, discovery becomes easier. Right? The reason Twitter could go from zero to 500 million users in four years is why? Because there are two billion consumers on the web. The same principles, obviously, not exactly the same, but similar principles will apply to SMBs. So those are five trends you know, that I think are very, very interesting. And if you're building a technology company, be it software, be it hardware, be it networking, be it cloud, be it consumer-centric, or be it even services, these trends are very, very interesting. Because I believe the way to build a really big company fast is to actually, one of the things you should have is tailwind. You know, if you're trying to sell something to Morgan Stanley, whew, boy, good luck. No, I mean, I'm sure you'll it'll it'll do fine. But I'll have even more gray hair by the time you're done. But if you build something for Morgan Stanley, that's mobile first, that leverages video, that's got a kick-ass social platform, you deliver over the cloud, all of a sudden you got their attention. So as you, as you guys are building your companies, I think it, it's important to think about how do you leverage these sort of mega trends. The last thing I want to wrap up with is as you think about these trends, right, what becomes really important is deep capability. You know, to solve really big problems, you need to have really big capability. Take voice, non-trivial problem. Video streaming over super narrow bandwidth, very big problem. So deep capability, let's say in computer science, that's probably pretty important. In specific aspects of computer science, pretty important. When you think about internet and mobile-based distribution, distribution is very, very important. And it used to be, the way you built a great company is you go hire a giant sales force. You know, every startup I talk to, I want to hire a sales force. Ooh, cool. Why? Why? I mean, with LinkedIn, you can pretty much get to anybody in the world that you want. And if you have a really sexy product, they'll probably listen to you. Right? Druva, one of the most valuable software companies that get built out of India. Got to the first $3 million of revenue, not a single sales guy. Not a single one. All online. All SMB. So capability when it comes to deep engineering that will help you build the product, distribution, deep capability in design. Today, if you're building a consumer internet company, and quite frankly, if you're building a SaaS company, design becomes very important. Nobody wants to actually spend any time on a boring website. It takes me about two seconds. Awesome design, crap design. Design is not a skill that, you know, engineers have had, right? I mean, I'm an engineer, I really don't have design skills. That's very important. And then you need many other skills around being able to build a team and raise funding and so on and so forth, right? So it's really about figuring out, you know, how are you going to get some massive tailwind, right? Build, ride some trends that are going to go for five, ten years, so you're not fighting, you know, it's that whole question, right? If, I, if you're in a services company, go get 50 killer mobile engineers. Boom, sold out. You have 50 guys who can write C++? Problem. Just there's so many of them. So build the capability and make sure you have the right set of capabilities that come together. 
Because this really is about, I think this next decade really is about breakthrough products, world-scale distribution, and awesome design. So I hope that's helpful. Let me now uh, maybe take a couple of questions. Yeah. How would these trends phase out or work through? How would these trends in rural India play out given uh, the environment and the infrastructure that exists? Yep. Any absolutely. thoughts? Great question. So, mobile. Rural India will access the internet through mobile. Very few of them will actually have a desktop or a notebook simply because of power, actually. There's no power. Right? Second, low bandwidth. We don't have bandwidth over here. They're definitely not going to have bandwidth for a long time to come. So we're going to have bandwidth optimized, right? So this is the whole thing. Third, they definitely won't speak English, and many of them may actually not be able to write any in any language. So natural user interface. And fourth, in those communities, if you can actually figure out how to build a social layer, it's really powerful because there, if they know that somebody in the next village has used it, they probably will use it. So actually, a lot of these trends become even more accentuated and become even more important as you go in a place like India to, let's say, tier 3, tier 4, tier 5 towns, because they only are going to have a mobile internet access. They want to interact in voice. And quite frankly, it's kind of like speaking on a phone, etc. OK. Any other questions? You have discussed how the web and the mobile is going to evolve over the next five years. Can you share some insight on how do you think the search and online advertising is going to evolve with the new web? The, what is the search? Search and the online advertising. How is it going to evolve over the next five years to go along with the vision that you have shared with us? Well. Great question. You want to work for Google? Look, I mean, 2 billion people going to 3 billion people, they're going to want to search. Search will keep growing rapidly. Mobile search becomes very important. Voice search. I don't know how many of you have voice search. Voice search, super hot product. Actually, I don't really want to type my search. I just want to speak to it. What time does this meeting end, right? You should tell me. So natural user interface, in fact, if you go to labs, um, with several companies, Google, Microsoft, etc., you have retina search. So basically, you can voice combined with looking at the search box, you can just speak it and look at it. So basically, all these technologies, so mobile video search, right? In India, YouTube is the second largest search engine, video search. So search will continue to evolve, it'll get smarter, it'll get deeper, right? I mean, at the end of the day, search should be able to predict what you really want before you ask for it. And that's the holy grail. Yeah. Rajan, um, um, broadband, after 20 Mbps, we decided to do it. But places like Korea, have more than 100 Mbps. Yeah. They've not been able to find apps that can use that kind of size. You with me? Your thoughts on where we are going in terms of broadband, in terms of how big it can get, and what actually are the kind of apps that are coming because right now we are topping it at about 20 Mbps really. We are not able to do more with it. Yeah, you know, so that. I actually don't know the Korea example, but um, you know, I was in the US last week and they're tapped out, right? I mean, New York City, you can't even access like YouTube. It's just so bad. I mean, here, we'll be next 100 years, we won't have that. No? Imagine we have 100 million people today on narrow band networks. And we don't have enough bandwidth. I don't know how many of you have 3G, but man, it whoop and stuff. Now imagine a billion Indians on the internet all watching video all the time. I think we're going to need a lot of bandwidth. So actually, you know, the Korea, my view is the world is not going to have enough bandwidth for a very long time to come, right? The average smartphone user in India spends, in India, spends four hours, four to five hours now, today, uh, on the internet. Now, I'd just like to imagine 500 million smartphone users spending five hours online watching videos, or watching, you know, video-related things. I don't know, I, have to, I should run the math on that, but there's some, some curve that says, you know, how many hours of video this is that, right? So, you know, I'd love to see a world where we have, I mean, YouTube doesn't have enough, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> you know, 
New York City, you too. Not enough bandwidth. And I think in New York City, we're probably at least, what, three, four, five years away from before you'll actually have enough bandwidth. And then we have markets like India. I mean, I'm really hoping that in my lifetime, you'll have enough bandwidth. But I'm not very optimistic. And by the way, that's an opportunity for entrepreneurs, right? Because that is a huge problem, right? And it's a technically, as you know, very difficult problem to solve. Solve that problem. Thank you. That's the kind of company that the big tech companies want. Yeah. We're rolling out 1 GBPS connections in, in Kansas City in the US. So I'm just wondering, what's the vision behind that? Why would people or home users? Oh, we want to figure out what he's just saying. I mean, uh, we are still no, seriously. It's like, OK, what if you watch video all the time? There are five of you in the household. You're watching video all the time. What is that then? One GGP, is that good enough? No, seriously, we just want to know. We want to know what it feels like. Blink of an eye, you got all this bandwidth, right? I see. Blink of an eye, boom. You know, it's very interesting. You know, uh, 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 Jaivir was kind enough to download this video. So we were sitting next door. I don't know, he spent 15 minutes. Then he walked around. We got this amazing card, some telco here, right? Super high bandwidth, super, OK, very good, super. You know? And then I think he went to the uh, business center. It took him like half an hour. It's in the business center. One of the best hotels in India, right? So. No, we, I mean, I think the question he asked is a great one. I don't think we know. I see. But I think in my lifetime, that's not going to be where I'm going to live. That's not going to be a problem. I mean, the problem is going to be not enough bandwidth. But we, you know, we're always trying to test the limits, right? Right. Thanks. It should be like electricity. I mean, infinite for $20 a month. Yeah. Expansion happening to 3 billion people, and you spoke about video analytics. I mean, what, what is your vision around that? What happens to data? Mm -hmm. Well, EMC, you should buy EMC as a stock. <laughs> you know, Dropbox. All these things are like really interesting because, exactly, I mean, what are you going to do with all this data? Well, it's got to be stored, it's not going to be enough of it. But in terms of analysis? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge opportunity, right? Analytics. Analytics is not going and running credit scoring for Morgan Stanley, right? Correct. That's not analytics. Analytics is to figure out what 3 billion people are doing every day, every second. That's analytics. That's big data. You want big data? That's big data. Big data is not like, you know, which customer is going to treat the telecom network tomorrow? Oh, come on, man. It's like a, that's like an undergraduate physics problem, you know, like statistics problem. So I think that is, these are the opportunities, right? I mean, the analytical. The scale is humongous if you can solve it. And I think these are the problems. I think hopefully there's one message you take away is, you know, solve big problems. It's harder, takes more time, but when you solve it, it's going to be huge, right? It's basically to build a huge company to solve a big problem that's worth solving. I have one question. So if someone is building a, you know, let's say a consumer internet business in India, you talked about Google Glasses, natural user interface. So I was just wondering what are the things like an entrepreneur like us, we need to take care of or think about architecturally in terms of our design or whatever, so that we can capitalize on these products and ensure that we can reach out to more people. So I mean, it gives us a, you know, if we plan for it now, it gives us a structural advantage against our competitors in the future. So I mean, I'm, I'm asking you the question for products like Google Glasses, how can you you know, how can we plan it in our design, you know, in some general I, know, I, mean, I think, look, it's, let's take Google Glass out of the question. No, I mean, I mean something, on, something on those lines that you talked about. I think, you know, let's say, are you, are you building a consumer-centric business? Or yes, are you in a B2C. B2C. It's a B2C business. B2C it's business. called Dine Out. It's basically something on the lines of open table. So, you know, if, if it's something on those lines, I mean, how can I take advantage oh, of... Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you. So you're building open table, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to go to your website and I don't want to go to your app. I just want to talk to my phone and I want you to book me a table. Okay, Olive, 8 o'clock. Thank you. Bye. That's the use case. Right. right? That's the use case. Give me that use case. That's the future. I don't want to go to your site and like do a search for Italian restaurants and then you tell me like here are the five in your neighborhood and here are the user rankings. Dude, that's old. You know? I want to go to Olive. You book me a table right now. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to look at anything. I just want to speak into my phone. Right. That's the future. Natural user interface, mobile, easy, fast. And you do everything else. You figure out what the user reviews are. I don't want to, no seriously, right? Why do I have to look at the user reviews? You should figure it out, that's called machine. You know, like, you should do that. You're the app. Why should I look at the reviews? Right. 
You agree? I mean, like, right? You know, There's no I, user review thing. I mean, like, you have to figure it out. I mean, this is the use case which is uh, my question is when I'm planning to build something like this, what are the things that I need to take care of? Like, I mean, well, how, I mean can, you, can you do what I just said, man? If you just no, do, not, you no, I cannot. Funded more than I, you will believe. No, I know, I know. <laughs> I cannot you just do, do what I did. You don't have to worry about anything. I know, I know. Exactly. Google will probably buy you. Like, they bought Zagger. <laughs> exactly. So, ah, I mean, so build I, that. <laughs> right. Don't worry about anything else. Perfect. All right, thank you. Okay, now let's take one more question oh, yeah. and we're done. Yeah. yeah. You said that uh, if, if a company has 50 or 100 kick-ass mobile programmers, it can kind of rule the world. And you also made a distinction that a mobile, a C++ programmer is not a mobile programmer. And when you're talking about kick-ass mobile programmers, you're talking about a commodity that is very rare. So, I mean, what is it that you think of when you say 100 kick-ass mobile programmers and they'll rule the world? You know, programmers who can do HTML5 apps, world's best programmers plus designers. Give me 100 of those. <laughs> Right now. You have those? I'd love to find those, by the way. Yeah? Hmm. But, but what does that add up to? Like, I mean. Look, there's so much demand in the world. All you have to do is get, when you have those 100, get on a plane, go to Silicon Valley, I'll introduce you to three guys. <laughs> and you can have, meet them for two hours, you come back, you hire your next 100, and then you can go back again. But look, there's a huge supply demand imbalance, right? Think about what's going on in mobile. <laughs> it's huge. Now, it's not just, you know, like here when I see app developers, they design an app. Even I don't want to use it, you know, and he's my friend. Imagine a consumer. I don't want to use this thing. Mm. So it's design and engineer put together, build the app. So you mean people who can do end-to-end? -end? Obviously, no. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, who is going to do the other stuff? Sure. That's what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. Mobile app. You've got to give me the app. Don't give me the code. I want the app. Right, the, the core doesn't help you, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta have an app. App that consumers love. Great. Thanks. All right, guys, I gotta run. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>